Good afternoon. Uh, good to see a, a fair number here today, a better number than I think we've had recently, and so at a, an ordinary meeting. Um, and uh, this is a hybrid meeting. For those of you online, if you look at the top left of your screen, you should, should see a small green shield. That symbol means that you are using the most up-to-date version of Zoom and that it is secure. Questions may be asked at the end of the lecture, but as you will be muted, please use the chat facility found at the bottom of your screen. And if you put your question in the chat, they will then be read out by the Royal Astronomical Society Astronomy and Geophysics editor, Dr. Sue Bowler, uh, at the appropriate time. If you are in the lecture hall and wish to ask questions, of course, you'll, that's fine. When you answer, ask a question, could you please say your name at the beginning of asking the question? It does help with observatory making a record of the proceedings. Just a few important deadlines. The deadline for the next RAS grants round is February the 20th. The deadline for submission to the GCSE poster prize is the 14th of February. Further details of that can be found on the uh, RES website, so if you know uh, either teachers or children of GCSE uh, age, it might be worth having a look at the website because that's quite an exciting project. Uh, the deadline for the call for suggestions for RES specialist discussion meetings for next year, so 2023-24, is March the 10th, so it's not long away, okay, for, if you want to suggest specialist discussion meetings for next year. Uh, Suggestion and invited from fellows who wish to propose specialist discussion meetings uh, starting from October 23. Please see the website for further details. And a slight, a slight innovation next year. If you're thinking of proposing a specialist discussion, there's going to be the possible option. We haven't settled the details yet. The possible option of proposing a specialist discussion meeting for outside of London, in other words, at your local university or other institute. So if you're thinking of a specialist discussion meeting, you might want to think whether you might, might be an interesting idea to hold it uh, locally. So that is, that is a possibility. Uh, and you put that in your application, obviously. Right, on to today's uh, programme. Uh, now the first speaker we were to have uh, Dr. Beatrice San Shekano, uh, who is getting the Fowl Award, I'm very sorry to say, was taken ill this morning. Um, I gather she's out of hospital and back at home, but obviously this is, we, we didn't insist that she came and uh, gave her talk. Uh, that talk will then be given at another time later in the year, and I trust it's your will that I should uh, convey our best wishes for her speedy recovery. Okay, thank you. Okay, the first talk today is by Professor uh, Aleri Price uh, from Aberystwyth. Uh, Aleri Price uh, graduated in physics from the University of Wales, uh, going on to uh, obtain her PhD in ionospheric physics for an investigation of small-scale irregularities in the ionosphere using radio signals from satellites. She was appointed a physics lecturer at Aberystwyth in 1989 and has progressed up the tree in Aberystwyth, a very valued colleague across Wales, and uh, I'm invited to give her talk. Thank you. Thank you. Extending astronomy outreach through Eisteddfodau in Wales. Let's put the project in the perspective first. We've just heard about the importance of outreach in science and also the tremendous amount of excellent outreach that has been made through educational activities. But there is a tendency, at least I feel there's a tendency for such activity to reach those with an underlying interest in science. So the aim of this project was to extend astronomy and geophysics beyond the conventional outreach. When Mandy Bailey, when Dr. Mandy Bailey visited Aberystwyth over eight years ago for a town hall uh, meeting, interest was shown by several institutions, including the two Eisteddfodau. I'll say what these are in a, in a moment. But an inclusive combination of these institutions offered a novel way 
to reach an audience that we feel is much broader than those um, just with an immediate interest in science. Now, coming from a university uh, background, I think it's fair to say that we as lecturers um, are good at the science, and we're probably good at reaching those with an interest in science, but not necessarily the best at presenting um, in a way that reaches general audiences, especially if they're not interested in science. We need to think of alternative ways for that. And now here's to turn to the, well, I was hoping so, uh, To the list of um, main project team members. And there's rather a lot and lots of institutions. But this was key to the project and all of these played essential roles. And central to the project was really collaborations through, by, uh, between all of these people and all of the institutions. They all had complementary skills and they were brought together. So each organization uh, by itself had a lot to offer in its own right, but it was the combination of these that offered the new approach um, to the outreach. And to our knowledge, such a multidisciplinary collaboration between the arts and astronomy and geophysics on this scale certainly uh, had not been done previously in Wales. More about the contributors in a moment, but let's summarize the rationale of the project. So the aim was to introduce new audiences to astronomy and geophysics using the arts to enthuse these new audiences. Inclusivity was also high on the requirements to reach audiences in different geographic regions of Wales, city and rural regions, to reach those with and those without in particular natural interest in science, to reach those with Welsh as their first language and those who are learning the language, and to cover different socioeconomic backgrounds and also different learning needs, age and gender. And as I've mentioned, the collaborations were essential for the project. The two national Eisteddfodau um, the main institutions uh, of the project. And we have Ellen Ellis here um, from the National uh, Eisteddfod representing the Eisteddfod. Now, both of these Eisteddfod are major annual festivals in the calendar of Wales. The contributions of the public to these in both time and finance is enormous and shows the affinity of the people of Wales to the festivals. Whilst each Eisteddfod is about a week long, the activities leading to each of these occur over some two years prior to the event. So two years prior to the event leading to the event and that's involvement from the local community. Now, if we uh, look at the left-hand side there, the Irvaisdevod culminates with its national festival during the summer half-term holiday. But before this, it's got local and county um, rounds with the winners there representing their county at the National Eisteddfod. The Eisteddfod is the largest youth festival in Wales and probably one of the largest in Europe. It focuses on children and youth with participants between 8 and 25 year olds. Competitions include singing, dancing, craft, poetry, and its annual attendance is about 90,000. And in addition, we've got the um, prior rounds as well. On the right here, the National Eisteddfod is in early August. It may start at the end of July. And it's Wales' premier uh, cultural festival with competitions for all ages. And it also has large scale cultural events. Now, as for the year, it also includes many competitions and it's got the main prestigious poetry competitions. And for the project, we were very fortunate to have a winner of main bardic competitions on the science team, Howell Griffiths, 
with a background in geomorphology. The annual attendance of the National Estadbert is approximately 170,000. Now, the Estadbert by nature are inclusive. They provide for participants of different backgrounds, interests, age, fluency in Welsh, learning needs, and geographic areas. And we have on the map here the locations of the Estadbert during the period of the project. Now, both of the Estevode are touring festivals, so held in different locations in Wales, and both alternate between South and North Wales, such that in a year, the Ir will be at the in North Wales and the National in South Wales, and then the following year, vice versa. So the coverage uh, is good for the project. But there were other um, team members as well. And we have here Telescope on the far left-hand side there. Now, Telescope is a multimedia company. It was part of the project from the outset, but its role became crucial during the COVID lockdown. Then we've got the colleague Cymraeg Kenneth Lethal. It's the national institution that supports universities with the Welsh medium teaching. And then a Scotland Cloyd School, where Stefan Tudor, who specializes in astronomy, is the physics teacher. So all of these three institutions have expertise in communicating with different audiences and in different ways. There were fellows and scientists um, also uh, involved, contributors from several universities, Aberystwyth, um, UCL, MSSL, and we have Professor Geraint Jones here, um, with us uh, today, uh, Swansea, Cardiff, and University of Bristol. So each of us with our own research speciality. But as the project proceeded, additional science support came from other fellows, other scientists, teachers, and an amateur astronomer. And this was delightful to see. But so just to emphasize for this project, the scientists, we played support roles. We were there supporting on the science. So there are lots of us involved. Now, what I'd like to do is just to give a very, very quick look at some examples, not so much to focus on the examples, but to focus on trying to convey the additional collaborations with institutions and individuals. So at the top there, we have a mural by artist Rhiannon Roberts on the dark sky. But the workshop was supported by the Brecon Beacons National Park Education Department at the Visitor Centre on Dark Sky. The modern dance here with a celebrity, uh, uh, Eddie Ladd, was held at the prestigious Millennium Centre in Cardiff. It's in the foyer of the Millennium Centre. And it's allowed children from the area not normally involved in competitions to visit and participate in the Eisteddfod. Top left-hand side, they bring in the University of Wales Trinity St. David. They last led the uh, solar system workshops through craft activities with Wensley and Bainan and her students. And the exhibition was at the entrance of one of the Eisteddfod. Instead, the scientists are labeled underneath these who, who had inputs. Top right hand side, uh, storytelling by Fiona Collins with Crankies. And she was the winner of the Learner of the Year Prize, Learning Welsh, in 2019. She also highly commended the help and interest of a teacher at one of her, uh, one of the schools involved in her workshops. What are you going to, oh, right at the beginning, right at the outset of the project. We had traditional clog dancing by Dancer Brotav with Geraint Jones um, giving his expertise on the comets for um, that <clears throat> presentation. And finally, then here on the right hand side, the Sundial project by Eskol Glan Clouds. We've held um, Esther in the city 
And there are examples there of competitions bringing in space themes, Seren, Govod, Planeta. These are all themes of space related into the competitions of the Eisteddfod. And then we have Paul Roche and Sarah there providing backup in the Gwydonme, in the science venue there for that uh, Eisteddfod. That was in Cardiff Bay. And in that uh, Eisteddfod, some of these arts and crafts, they were actually displayed in the Senedd, in the Senate then building, in the foyer there. And I put that one in the left-hand side in particular. It was um, a winning entry by a pupil in a skull Habod Lon. Now, a skull um, Habod Lon is a school for pupils with a wide range of special needs. Um, and it also featured, it was picked up by a magazine Golog, uh, with a feature on that, so Gofod and Spartino are creating space um, inspiring creativity. Immersive um, insula installation with artist Jessica Lloyd Jones on the left hand side there, uh, shown at both of the Estevote and also composing workshops. So the performance is linked with those with. Um, musician Ray Gwynedd, and that again was for Welsh learners. Poetry. Um, there were poetry linked with the uh, project. On the left-hand side there, yeah. there is Google Mars by Howell Griffiths, and in fact Howell included this poem and the one he wrote for the launch in his book Llif Cochau, which won the very prestigious Poetry Book of the Year in 2018. Um, and then there were other examples as well uh, of, of the poetry. And this one then uh, was a songbook, Seren We Bachanioneb Erish, the shooting star under the songs, so bringing astronomy into the songs, so they would be available for future Esther Vodder also. Two more uh, examples. We have Astro Cymru with Emma Wright on the left-hand side there. The Colle Cymru Cenedlaethol, that is where the um, activities are shown, displays of photos of the activities are shown in the Colle Cymru. Mm -hmm. And then um, a lecture I gave to the Learning Society of Wales at an Eisteddfod at the edge of space. Drawing attention, this was picked up um, in the magazine Golwg by Non Tidir. Keep that in mind for another article that comes later on. That's why I'm flagging that in particular. Um, we really appreciate the help the RAS has given us and the NG Journal. Genesis Associates as well, we heard from Sarah Jenkins earlier, and the Royal Observatory Greenwich uh, was very important with collaborations with Telescope during the lockdown period, and also we had input from Nigel Moretti to the um, Shoyergan project. So let's turn to the Shoyergan. So Llaurgan, now this was a collaborative opening musical production in the Ceredigion Esteddfod last year in 2022. And it was way beyond what I had imagined when we were writing the application. I think if I recall rightly in the application, we put something like um, concert items. But this was a major um, musical um, production. Uh, on an astronomical theme, which the Esteva did secure additional sponsorship for. Um, it was held at the main pavilion, so capacity of about 1800, televised on S4C, essentially live, and subsequently available on iPlayer with English subtitles. Professional actors, musical director, um, a band, and also a volunteer choir in excess of 100 um, people and they've been practicing for weeks, months before the Estevo in preparation for this, so bringing in the local people as well. It was set in the space exploration context and it also pre um, presented some important questions on, for example, ambition, challenges of raising family, balancing work, traveling with home life. These are questions I'm sure relate to many of us, in particular to female scientists, but probably to all of us. Now, if you consider behind the scenes, Claire David there in the centre is the author of Feuergang, 
and she re received science support from Hugh Morgan at Aberystwyth um, and also had experience of stargazing uh, with local amateur astronomer we have here on the right hand side, David Wyn Morgan. He's dressed up here in another context, I won't go into that. But um, he was an amateur astronomer and took her out to see the stars. And she also discussed with Nigel Moretis a, um, a British Antarctic survey on the sounds of space. Now, for most of the duration of the project, that is pre-COVID, the workshops and the exhibitions had been taken what well, they had been held on the Estevard field outside the science venue. The idea was to go out of the science venue with these um, exhibits and projects. But in the final year of the project, that is last year now in Keredigion, substantial effort was made by the Estevard to bring the general audience into the science um, venue, so to turn things around, if you like. And the venue was a science and technology village at a location close to the Estevard Pavilion. Now, the idea of a village had been tried previously, but I think I'm right to say, Alan, correct me if I'm wrong, that it was in Caradigion that it was felt to be successful. And for this, the approach of the RAS 200 project was applied. <clears throat> the Estevard appointed a science coordinator. And Tanya Jones, who is also with us today, Tanya, with a background in art and experience in STEM outreach, was a key to the success of the village. There was a dome, you can see it's on the left-hand side and the top um, there, called the Sferen, that's playing on words, Seren for star and Sphere for sphere, the Sferen, and it was there where the talks were held. And then we had the Sferen, or the satellite, uh, which was larger, um, where activities for children were held and smaller stalls. The main stalls were in a semicircle around, um, you can see them starting there and they came around better. I'll show that better later on, I hope. Uh, the project had two stalls there with the main inputs from Cardiff University, MSSL and Aberystwyth University. And bottom two here on the right, we were delighted actually to have the President and the Senior Secretary of the RAS visit the Science Village and the Estevard, and it was really very much appreciated that they'd made the effort to visit rural Wales. With all the travelling, we know that it can be difficult, so thank you very much. We don't often get such visitors um, in Estevard, and David Morgan, the amateur astronomer, was delighted to talk to Mandy and also students glad of the opportunity to meet the President. Opportunities were given um, by the project to early career scientists and students for traditional outreach in the stalls and also to give some first presentations through the medium of Welsh. There was a series of RAS talks throughout the week at a prime time. Now, some of these were with the artists, some with early career scientists and some by established scientists. And we were delighted that Rhys Morris, from the University of Bristol presented first images of the James Webb telescope. It was only a matter of days after they were made available. So it was fantastic. We had such things coming into the ISTEV, but such new science material. And then also uh, Professor Geraint Jones gave a talk about the next mission to a comet. Now this idea of a daily talk at a set time, I feel worked well. We call them talks rather than lectures for increased flexibility with a duration of about 20 minutes and discussion. But a new aspect that was introduced uh, in the project was the role of professional communicators. The significance of this became clear to us during the COVID lockdown. And building on this, each of the RAS talks was chaired by Ellen Rees. You can see her in the ones on the left-hand side um, there. And she had a way of drawing the audience into the presentation in a way I certainly couldn't do. Um, so um, that, that proved to be in, invaluable. The one on the left, the example there, is um, interesting. We Again, that was picked up by the press, and that was um, National Press magazine, Golog. And it was because we had Gwen Llian Williams, then early career scientist, non-tidir, <laughs> on the previous article she did, 
and brought that into completely unprompted into Golog. So that was a very um, well, we're very pleased to, to, to see that, that the project had uh, managed to do that. Now we've touched on the different impacts of the project. We also need to look at the legacy. And it's not always often easy to identify this. Clearly there are photos and memories of the activities, but I believe that the legacy is much more than this. Hopefully, We've shown that how the project has enhanced collaborations and networking across the disciplines. So that was crucial, and hopefully that will last between individuals and institutions. The project also contributed significantly to evolving a new way of presenting science to the public. It also revealed to us the important roles that professional communicators have, that is working with scientists the role they have in getting the message over to the general public. As evidence for this, we have here an activity. Now, this wasn't directly part of the project, but it was set on the, pro on the pattern of project activities. This was the opening show at the Science Village every day. Um, Kefila Seir, Horse of the Stars, show for the family, very popular. It had a professional storyteller on the left-hand side, um, there, the Everest Film Musica Orchestra, or, or um, some members of that. It uh, had animation and it was written by uh, a prominent bard and a composer. So, bringing those ingredients, people outside the science, but to present in a way that was very, very popular. For the evolution, what you've got on the left hand side there is the first published with honor science tent in the National Estate of Dangor, 1971, so more than 50 years ago. So, and that at the time was a huge breakthrough to get science onto the um, Estate um, field. Similarly there then on the right-hand side, the first with on there um, in the Erbe Sevod, and that was also in Ceredigion with funding from STFC to start that. And from those sort of humble beginnings, then we had the pavilion um, for the National Estate of and the with on there, uh, much larger in size for the Erb Eisteddfod. Now, the recent development of the Science and Technology Village. And we hope that this now gives an additional step to engaging the general office, uh, the general audience, I'm sorry. And um, I think, um, well, we hope that people that are not so interested in science may be feeling less intimidated in visiting this more open science venue. But to finish, I was absolutely delighted when Geraint uh, drew my attention or found a small clip um, uh, on, on the BBC iPad of Lloyrgan in, um, in English for the Estevod. And it also shows an aerial view of the science village. And I think this summarizes the impact and the potential legacy in a far better way than I, as a scientist, can do. So thank you very much, Geraint, for finding um, this Jochen Bauer. So let's take a look at this to finish up this presentation. Thank and you. the Estevod Right, I've asked for it to be stopped there because you can see an aerial, oh, wonderful, an aerial view. There's the science uh, village there with the main pavilion uh, to its left. So thank you, I can proceed. To start the week with a spectacular opening performance, and this year's show certainly doesn't disappoint. It's set in 2050 and tells the story of the first woman in space with the Eisteddfod Choir providing a huge wall of sound for this spectacular opening extravaganza. Can you tell us a bit more about the songs and the storyline of Dial Dan? Well, it's a moon musical and it all centres around um, the first female astronaut on the moon. So she just happens to be a woman from Ceredigion, so it's set in the future and it's an aspirational story and it's an allegory about ambition, about love, about balancing, you know, work life and, and family life and um, there's plenty to enjoy it. The leading thing that story, concert, a show like this has been staged at the Eastern before. It's really exciting. And for me, as 
30 something year old woman to have a 30 something year old woman at the forefront of the story as well and and really talking about things that we we, we can all relate to you know and the songs are a big part of the show absolutely the songs are gorgeous and we have a choir of 140 people um backing up these songs and yeah, yeah just creates an incredible atmosphere how do you sum up for your dad? Well, it's quite flowy. Uh, there's a lot of rhythms going on, but at the same time, it's very atmospheric. And, you know, the, the choir gives it a big, warm sound. <laughs> Um, we used a lot of drum machines and a lot of um, kind of close harmonies. Um, so it's something that really, really particular relates with the choir. Um, it's a huge sound, very different sound, and a sound that probably none of the Estelwood folk have heard before. The Estelwood choir is a big part of the performance. Yeah, it's um, it's a community choir, and so the invite goes out to anybody who wants to be a part of it. Some have never sung in public, let alone stood on a stage this huge. And some people who are professional singers, teachers and conductors, there's a real variety of people in, in, in the choir. <laughs> How will you sum up this big opening show? Well, it's ambitious, it's surprising. I think it's a show that the Estelwood have never seen before, and it takes us into the future and the past. Up soon. So, thank you to the RAS. Yo, um, thank you. Um, questions, anybody in the room with questions, first of all? Steve. Um, I mean, I was, I was struck by the member of kind of multidisciplinary things, which it seemed to kind of come naturally. Is that part of the Icelandic tradition, or is I was wondering why so much is multidisciplinary? Is it because the Icelandic started as an art festival and kind of that's what it's kind of into art, or is it one of the old kind of interdisciplinary? Yes, Stavart is multidisciplinary by whatever. I don't know, Alan, do you would like to comment on this, Stavart? Um, if you can wait for the microphone, that would help. But it's also embraced science in, in, in over the past 50 years, which is fantastic from the standpoint of science. Yeah, the Stavart's a, um, we have around 25 stages. So we have productions like that one. We also have, uh, we have a literature village. We have a science village, as you've seen. Now we've developed that recently with the help of um, this project. We have um, a children's village, a, a, a folk village, dance, all all the art forms really and we obviously have things like diversity accessibility inclusivity equality the environment and well-being at the heart of all our programming um, we exist to promote the welsh language and the culture in wales um, and as we are evolving as the world around us evolves so we are there to celebrate our culture um, nationally and internationally so we're we're developing collaborations across the world, really. Um, so, yeah, we are multi art form festival, eight day festival, 170,000 people come and you don't have to speak Welsh to come and enjoy the festival. We I can encourage you all to come along and be immersed in Welsh culture. So it, it was very appealing how the different disciplines seem to naturally connect, whereas a lot of the things i've seen outreach things i've seen elsewhere you you do get art and science but it's it's kind of a more kind of added on rather than something that seems to kind of grow naturally i think i think we can we've proven in a way that um, the arts do help us promote other things like science you know and that was that's the beauty of this project with the support of ras it's it's just allowed us to have that focus because obviously this in the science village we you know, 
it's the, all the STEM subjects. We we celebrate them all and we give them all a stage. It's just happened this project, we celebrated geophysics and astronomy, so um, which is fantastic. And we will continue to do that. So, but we, we by using the arts, we can celebrate other subject matters that are more difficult maybe to draw people in. Thank you very much, Steve. So this is just for the record, Larry. I have your proposal open in front of me. <laughs> and it says, envisaged highlights are musical items from the Musicians Medal Competition at the National Eisteddfod and the Commission Music at the Erd Eisteddfod. So I think you kind of delivered big time on those. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, because I know that was one thing we had a little bit of a problem, but it went to the musical production and the compositions there. Like Topsy, it grew. Yes. yes. More questions? One online here. Um, this is from this is from Geraint Day. Have any I said for our sessions included mention of the idea of alternative constellation names taken from characters and creatures in Welsh medieval folk tales? Now there are some um, nice. I'm trying to think now. Did I have them in the in the actual lead into the presentation of this on on the. Um, uh, part of the colleague Cymraeg, but I have had some, we haven't had meetings on that, but we have had some nice ideas coming in. Um, I'm trying to remember some now, but it's a good, yeah. Anybody with ideas of these, please, yes, send them to us. I, I, do, I know very little Welsh, but the, the Welsh days of the week are all planetary, aren't they? Yeah. A complete set, yeah. whereas English ones have some in, in, intruders. <laughs> <laughs> or, or based on this, yeah. yeah. Okay, any further questions or? Okay, we'll move on to the next one. Thank you very much indeed. Now to the next talk uh, from Andy Newsom, Access to the Universe for All, which sounds like a pretty tall order. Andy Newsom is Professor of Astronomy Education and Engagement at Liverpool John Moores University. After studying at cosmology at Glasgow University and working as an observational astronomer at the University of Southampton, he joined John Moores in 1998 to help set up the educational arm of the Liverpool Telescope, I hope I'm getting this right, um, which later became the National Schools Observatory, which of course is one of the largest educational projects, astronomical education projects in the world. Andy. Thank you. Thank you all very much for staying. Um, and thank you. It, it's a real honour and uh, pleasure to be here to do this today. Um, I'm lucky enough with during the uh, or the special discussion meeting earlier, there was a, a brief conversation about sustainability of educational projects. And I'm lucky to have been involved in one, um, which I have personally been involved in for more than 20 years, and it's still going strong. And what I wanted to do today was just give a summary of the status of this project where we come from, where we're at, and hopefully a little bit about where we're going to. Um, partly to show off, because I'm very proud of it, but partly to show what can be achieved if you're fortunate enough and work hard enough to get that long-term sustainable support, support so that you can gradually and continually grow something rather than be expected to leap in, do something, and then disappear. So that's really what I want to talk about. Um, the background to this is astronomy and education. As many of us know, um, both anecdotally and from hard evidence, astronomy is a science that can, maintains interest, regardless of gender, regardless of ethnic background, regardless of social background, right throughout the school years of a large number of school students. And that's not true for most areas of science. Um, there's a lot of evidence to support this. The, the, the first study I came across was Osborne and Collins in 2000, which stated very clearly that this was the only science that kept that interest going. And that's nice, but it's also a responsibility. It means that those of us in astronomy, in geophysics, who have that immediate, easy access to enthusiasm, we need to use that. We need to use that fascination to help teach and to help enthuse school children all around the world about other areas of science, about the computing and the engineering and even the art that leads into our subject. 
If we're all we're doing is going out there and promoting astronomy, we're wasting our time because we don't need to. What we need to do is use that continuing fascination to open the horizons of as many people as possible to the possibilities that face them in the other areas that we know are just as exciting. I like astronomy, but it's not better than other areas of science. It's just the one I've picked. Other areas of science are equally exciting. Other areas of computing, other areas of engineering, are just as exciting and in some ways more important. Um, which brings me to how we go about doing this. And this is the key. This is our observatory, where our telescope is, the Liverpool telescope. This is the Observatorio de los Estados Machachos um, on the Palma in the Canary Islands, and it's gorgeous. I don't get to go there as often as I would like. Um, this is a photograph I took when I was last there. That was 2015. That was my first trip since 2000. Um, but it's an astonishing place aesthetically, but it's also an astonishing place to see the skies. And that's why we have our big toy there. This is the Liverpool Telescope. Um, this is sunset on the Palma. The only reason the photograph is being taken is because that weather is rubbish. Um, you don't expect that much cloud up there. I think if the, if the weather had been any better, um, they wouldn't have been outside taking photographs. Uh, Mike certainly wouldn't. But this is a telescope that was built by the university, Liverpool John Moores University, quite a few years ago now. And it's not a particularly big telescope. The mirror is a two meter mirror, but it's special because it's a fully robotic telescope. And, and that means it's not operated by people. It's operated by software. Many of you will know this. Some of you will have used the telescope for your own research. Um, and it means that it can be a very flexible tool for science, but also for other things. Those of you who like your stats about these things, two meter primary mirror, got a nice range of different instruments on it. You know, there's an, an optical camera, there's a fast camera for doing rapid measurements. There are spectrographs, there's a polarimeter, don't understand that one. Uh, we've got sky cameras, but there's all these different instruments that can be used very rapidly. Change over time between any two instruments is less than a minute. Um, and so science programs can be designed, which bring together different aspects of the kind of measurements we want to make on one instrument at one time. It moves quickly. Talk a little bit more about fast movement later, but that means it physically moves rapidly across the sky. So it can react to sudden events and it's fully automated. There are no human beings involved in the operation of this during the night. We're all asleep or at the pub. While this thing's working, it's making decisions based on the science, on the weather, on recent discoveries. If a satellite detects a gamma ray burst, it'll tell the telescope, the telescope will start observing it. We don't need people to get involved in that process. So that's a very powerful way of doing science. That's why the telescope was built. That's what it spends the majority of its time doing. And a lot of people get to do this. So we get astronomers at JAMU, we own the telescope, we built the telescope, it seems fair that we get some time on it. Um, but astronomers in the UK get a, a good slab of time on the telescope via the PAT process, those of you who know about these things. Um, astronomers in Spain get a lot of time. Span, Spain is, a, is the country that runs the Canary Islands. Um, so this is essentially to avoid paying too much rent. But other astronomers around the world, and I don't just mean professional astronomers. This is a telescope which regularly has applications from non-professional astronomers, so-called amateur astronomers who have good ideas, don't necessarily have the resources for large research programs, but they have good, relatively small ideas that this telescope can do for them. And so that goes into the mix as well. We use it for our students, undergraduate and postgraduate students on our uh, programs at John Moores. But the important one for me is the schools. And this is not an add-on. Before we'd even started raising the funding to start the company to build the telescope, this was built into the program. Making dedicated time on this telescope available to schools has been built in since before I joined the project 20 odd years ago. It's fundamental to, for what we do because we can. Mike Bode, who set this project up, came along with the basic idea that he wanted a telescope to study novae, exploding stars, you need rapid reaction. But he also felt that restricting that telescope to those already doing research was short sighted. And 25, 30 years ago, that was quite a, an unusual approach. I think it's more common now. I think this has helped to lead the way in that. But that's led to the National Schools Observatory, which started out simply as how can we use the Liverpool telescope from a school? Um, we can't just let school children onto the same interface that professional astronomers lose, use because they will get it wrong. They will be frustrated and disappointed and possibly even terrified. So we had to find a better way of doing that. So what we've done is we've developed a system that I'll talk about briefly. Um, and we have some basic 
aims behind all of this, some basic drivers. First of all, it's got to be free. And it's got to be free to anyone and anywhere. That's a relatively recent thing. We started out just looking at UK and Ireland, um, but we've been able to grow beyond that. We still have special access for UK and Irish schools. They have access to more observations to, to greater variety of the things that they can do. But this is still free to anyone anywhere. And I can talk a little bit about that later. We aim roughly for ages eight, to, sorry, six to 18. Uh, we do a little bit below six, but the actual access to the telescope is less excitement because frankly, it's quite hard to explain what it is and why it's exciting. They're much more interested playing around with giant pictures of the moon or working out the size of the solar system. So we do do things below six, but the telescope is aimed for ages six upwards. We don't go above 18 because they've left school by then, so what's the point? Um, we have about 20,000 registered observers. So this is teachers, students, educators around the world. At any one time, we've got about 20,000 of those registered and active. And since we launched, that means about 200,000 observing requests have been taken. It's not necessarily 200,000 observations, because some observing requests are more complicated than just one observation. But we deal with requests, so something that somebody wants to achieve, a three-colour image of a galaxy, monitoring part of the moon, that's an observing request. Now, you can put all that together, but unless you've got support material, which means that this actually works in the classroom with home educators, with keen students at the weekend, then it's not going to go anywhere. So most of our, our effort actually goes into the support resources. Um, the website gets about 3 million plus hits a year. That's ignoring things like bots and, um, and trawlers. That's 3 million people looking at the website, or at least people looking at the website 3 million times, slightly different thing. Um, slightly to the annoyance of the university, that's more than the university's website gets. Um, so it's big, it's successful. But I want to concentrate briefly on the way in which we use the telescope, because although the support resources do go beyond that, our fundamental, what you feel like our unique selling point, our USP, is this big toy in the Canary Islands. And in order to allow the widest number of people of all ages and abilities and, and experience to make use of this, we have a range of different ways in which the telescope can be used. There's very simple observing requests. Click on a picture of the moon on the bit you want it to observe. Get a list of a dozen or so nice galaxies. Choose one. It'll observe that for you. So that's the simplest end. Then there might be slightly more complicated programs of observation. Once you've got used to looking at galaxies, you will think, well, okay, I want to compare two galaxies. I want to compare their size. I wanted to compare their shape. I want to compare their color. So it can go away and do that for you. And then we go right the way up to large, often multi-school projects, often with research involvement. Um, so we've done a number of projects over the years with organizations like um, uh, Rotary International, uh, where we did some year-long projects with schools all over the country and they had a big final ceremony at the, uh, the Royal Institution which frankly was terrifying the first time I did that. Um, we'd had a project going for about six months where students were monitoring Novi in other galaxies and I had to present the data never having seen it until the slide came up which was great fun and really exciting because literally nobody had seen it. A program had created the slide and so nobody in that room knew what was coming along. And suddenly there was in front of them four new novae. They could see them explode. They could see them fade away. It was wonderful. And alongside that, we have non-observing activities. You don't have to use the, a telescope to get involved in astronomy or geophysics. So there's non-observing activities, non-observing research projects, vast archives out there. Can we get those into schools in a sensible way? That sort of thing. To give you an idea of what this looks like, this is the part of the website we call Go Observing. Um, you want to observe a galaxy? Click on the galaxy. You want to observe a planet, click on the planet. And as you get more experience, you'll gradually move down this and you'll start doing things like the advanced options or even what we have, the GCSE astronomy there is for people who are doing originally assessed coursework, but certainly experimental work using the telescope. The main difference between, behind that box is you can get it wrong. All the other boxes, we make sure that the observation that comes back is sensible. There, they can end up with something that isn't because that's how they learn. Uh, so there's a wide variety of things. And something that's got me very excited doing this is how much I've learned about what the universe looks like. My background is not in observational astronomy originally. My first degree was physics, computational physics. Um, I drifted into astronomy as a way of not dropping any other physics. 
is you do particle physics and you don't do all the other stuff. And you do nuclear physics and you don't do all the other stuff. You do astronomy, you do it all, it's brilliant. But that meant I actually had to look at the universe occasionally, which came as a shock. Um, and I drifted into deep sky work, uh, deep surveys, X-ray astronomy and so on. Um, and so I began to think of the brighter objects as more of a nuisance than anything else, in particular the moon. I spent five years of my professional life swearing at the moon. And then I started taking pictures of bits of it. This is an observation taken by a school of, of, of part of the moon during the full moon, just a small part of one of the observations. And there's some nice features on there. You can talk about the rays, you can talk about the dark and the light bits. But then you can come back a few days later and take another one and it's changed and that's brilliant. And you see different features. And if you would look closely, it genuinely is the same bit of the moon, I had to check. Um, but just seeing that excited me. And I've been studying bit things in space for decades. If you're a 10 year old and you see that for the first time, that really is stimulating. And you start asking questions. And maybe your teacher can't give you the answers. So you go and find out for yourself. And that's what this is all about. It's stimulating that curiosity. Um, we can also take nice pretty pictures. This is an observation taken for a student, Bryn Davies, um, who wanted to look at a star forming region. And so we've got a nice pretty picture for him. So we, we can do the whole range, but the ones I'm really interested in is the ones where somebody looks at that and says, oh, that's nice. What's that dark stuff? And then they're asking questions. So the fundamental driver behind all of this is raising people's curiosity and awareness of science as a means to answer questions, not as a big block of facts. And that leads us to how we work out whether this is working. Um, when we started out in this, I was a fairly typical new person, scientist getting involved in outreach and education. I thought, if we put it out there, everybody will think it's wonderful. They might well have done. I haven't got a clue because I didn't ask. Um, and I also didn't really know what I wanted to achieve. I just wanted people to use this because I thought that would be fine. Um, since then, I've started working with people who are much brighter than me, in particular, um, our two project managers, Stacey Abigail Mawson and Emma Smith, who have narrowed me down on the idea that actually, no, we need to know what we want to achieve, and then we need to know whether we've achieved it. And that led to an evaluation framework. Um, this is our first evaluation framework, well, second evaluation framework, which covered up until last year. We're developing a new strategy at the moment, which will have a new evaluation framework. Some of you will recognize this diagram from uh, earlier in the day at the, the, the uh, discussion meeting, which is looking at generic learning outcomes. We're not just interested in knowledge or even skills. We're interested in behaviors. We're interested in feelings. We're interested in the values that people have. We're interested in changing those. And so these are the things we want to achieve. And the evaluation framework says how we find out whether or not we've achieved those. And we think it's working. We have a number of different ways that we gather that information um, from the evaluation framework. Some of them are very simple, numbers, web analytics. This is on one of the web pages on, on the website where you can see our statistics month by month for who's coming along to the website, from where, what sort of things are they looking at. We have user groups who feed back to us, teachers in particular, but also other uh, users of the website who give us feedback on what they think works, what they think doesn't, what they think we should do next. And every so often when we can afford it, we commission an external evaluation, typically every three or four years. Um, in fact, typically every ref. Uh, we commission an external evaluation who do the job much more deeply than we could. They do case studies, they monitor lessons, they do interviews with pupils and teachers, they do larger surveys than, than we can manage. And that together gives us a pretty good idea of whether we're meeting our aims in the evaluation framework. Um, short summary, yes, we are. Slightly better than we'd expected, but that doesn't mean we can't improve. That's, a, that's the, the, the broad summary from our evaluation. Um, it's nice sometimes to look at the quotes you get though, because they put a little bit more nuance on that overall summary. Um, the evaluation report was very pointed out that it was very pro, uh, popular across all our user groups. So the evaluation targeted schools of in particular demographics, schools in rural areas, schools in cities, schools um, of different ages and so on. And it was popular across all of those, which was important. Um, there was a noticeable impact on the student learning outcomes that may not be a primary aim, but that helps. If students feel that they have learned something as well as having learned something, that's important. 
Um, but we also got quotes from individual students. You know, I feel like a proper astronomer. That is going to have a positive impact on, on that student's view of themselves as they move forward. Um, and we also got um, some, some feedback on the scope of this. Uh, and we had in one of our evaluation reports that the NSO was described as one of the most significant initiatives in the STEM field linked to a university. Um, we're not a big project. It's three people, effectively. We're, we're 3.2 FTE at the moment. Um, but we're able to do this because we've had the time to gradually build up. And every time we create something, we embed it and we just let it run and we can start working on the next bit. And that's meant that we can have been able to become significant without having to spend large amounts of money on short term uh, periods. So that's an important thing to bear in mind if you're looking for longevity. You don't need to be big. We'd love to be big. We haven't got the resources to be big, but you can be have a substantial impact by gradually, continually developing, working with people, sharing ideas, sharing the, the, the impact of what you do, and everybody will benefit from that. So that's where we are. But we're astronomers, some of us in the team are anyway, um, certainly all involved in science. We know you never stop. You always have to be looking to the next big thing, the next exciting aspect. And our next exciting aspect is this. Um, this is an, actually it's an engineering diagram of the new robotic telescope. Not a good name, I'm sure we will change it. It's going to be bigger. This is fundamental thing in astronomy. The next one you build has to be bigger. But mo perhaps more importantly, it's going to be faster. The current telescope, if it has a trigger to start observing somewhere different in the sky, can take a minute or two minutes to slew across and change instruments. This thing, which will have a four meter mirror, is hoping to get that down to less than 30 seconds, preferably 20, anywhere to anywhere at any point. That means the science it can do is significantly improved, particularly with facilities like the Vera Rubin Observatory coming along and throwing out large numbers of interesting things to look at. It will be working alongside the Liverpool Telescope. It's gonna be on the same observatory site. Um, so they'll be able to work together to share science between them. The LT might find an object, the NRT will then take spectroscopy of it and so on. But as far as I'm concerned, there is the potential for even more education, not just because we'll have two telescopes, but we'll have different ways of using those telescopes. And so if we're looking to the future, we have the possibility to take what we're doing and expand it considerably. And the obvious thing to do is international. Um, we can do a lot more work within the UK and Ireland. That's not a problem. Um, but we have the potential and the scope to take this and take it to an international project. But you don't do that by just coming along and changing the name to the International Schools Observatory. That is not going to work. Every single country has very, very different needs for their education, very different ways of going about things. So when we started thinking about international expansion, the first thing we did was just set up some way that anybody in the world could register. That was easy. Now what we've got to do is make it so that it's worthwhile for them to register. We're currently limited by telescope time when we do that, but with the potential to expand with the new robotic telescope and with potential other projects coming along, we should be able to expand that significantly. So what we've been starting to do is pilot projects in countries which are very different from the UK, particularly where the educational system and culture is very different from the UK. So our two main pilot programs so far have been in Thailand and Kenya. Um, Thailand has a very interesting problem in, in its development. It is developing quite rapidly. There are political issues at the moment, but nevertheless, it is developing quite rapidly. But it's developing faster than its workforce is. So it's developing a high-tech economy, but it doesn't have high-tech workers coming out of school. Um, and the Thai government have decided that one of the most important ways of developing that continuous supply of high-tech students and graduates is through astronomy, because as we know, people get excited about it. So we've been working with NARIT, um, who are the main research, astronomical research organization in, in Thailand, to develop essentially a version of the National Schools Observatory in Thailand. And they have a limited access to the Liverpool Telescope to do their own work. This is not a copy because it's based around their curriculum, their educational system, and most importantly, their culture. The way teaching works in Thailand is radically different from the way it works over here. And so we can't expect to come in and say, oh, this is how you should do everything, because we will be wrong. 
What we need to do is work with the people there who understand and offer ways in which we can support them in developing their educational project. In this case, by providing resources that they can adapt, access to a telescope and so on. So that's one way that we're doing this. Kenya was very different. Um, we started talking to a wonderful organization called the Traveling Telescope, who are awesome, um, who work a lot in rural areas around Kenya. And probably about a decade ago, there was a big educational push in Kenya for tablets, smartphone, large smartphone tablet things. They were put everywhere. Schools had them, community groups had them, individual people were given them thousands and thousands of these things. What they don't have isn't inter internet access, at least very rarely and very slow. So they've got these tablets and there's very little they can do with them because most modern apps are based around the idea of continuous rapid connection to the internet. So we started working with the Travelling Telescope on a simple app based on the moon, where most of the time you don't need to be connected. Maybe once a day, it'll sync itself up for 10 seconds or something like that and upload what you've done and download things. And it's, it's about exploring the sky. It's about looking at the moon. It's about the Kenyan culture. Um, it talks about the myths that the, 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 the Kenyan people have and the stories that the Kenyan people tell about the sky above them. So again, it's a very different way of looking at things because the, the social background is different and also the culture is different. And we've learned a lot from those two projects. And as we develop over the next few years, we're going to take what we've learned and bring it to other countries and work with them to develop. So piece by piece, country by country, working out the best way where we, what we've got can support what they want to do. So summary. Um, the Schools Observatory has been out there supporting education in the UK and Ireland and now beyond for more than 15 years. I can't remember when we launched, probably about 18 years ago, but it all got a bit blurred around there. Um, it's based around unique access to the Liverpool Telescope. That's what's allowed us to develop this project, but that's not the only thing we do. That's the bit we use to draw people in, but hopefully once they're in, there's lots of other things that they can do to support their education, to support their learning, to support their enthusiasm. So there's extensive educational material for all of STEM. Although we've looked at the website recently and it's more S than the 10. Um, so we're doing a lot more to develop that side of things alongside the new telescope. We're building a new telescope. We're designing software for the new telescope. If you can't get some technology, engineering and maths out of that, then really you've made a mess of things. So that's gonna be exciting. And we've got this potential for significant expansion alongside and in the future of the new robotic telescope project. So we've been doing this for 15 plus years. Um, I'm proud of what we've achieved, although I know we could do more. I think the next 15 years will make me even more proud and I will be able to retire very, very happy. So if you want to catch us on social media, we're all there. Um, you can drop me an email anytime and there's the website. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, Andy. Really inspiring. I'm at 20,000 registered yeah. users. That's, that's amazing. Okay, questions, please. At the back, can you wait for the microphone and state your name, please? So I'm Marguerite Laporte, and I introduced um, with a team of astronomy in schools during the 70s. And I, we found a very enterprising chief executive of education. And we pursued this, it was very successful. But one of the most successful projects that I did was um, build, having a telescope in a school playground during the daytime and building a um, polystyrene box on the back with a graph in it and treating it as a spectroheliscope. And it caused a sensation. Everybody came down, it's a good thing to do during the daytime. And I was quite impressed uh, recently in January, I was invited to go to a school to talk about astronomy because the children were so keen and they'd heard about me on the educational um, sort of thing. Anyway, I went and I was most impressed with what the teachers had done. The children had absolutely filled the ceiling with modules, rocket ships, and you name it, they'd built it. And they had sheets of paper asking question upon question upon question, most rewarding. And so, yes, continue. This is a wonderful, wonderful project. I wish you great luck with it all. Thank you very much. And that does sound like a superb project. So yes, um, there's, there's nothing quite like going into a classroom, particularly to be honest, a primary school classroom and just letting them loose with the questions um, because you will get asked things you do not know the answer to and probably should. 
my favourite one, I have to just say this one, I was in a primary school class and, and the small girl who had, hadn't asked anything yet, but she had a very serious expression on her face and eventually she put a hand up to, what happens to all the dark when you turn a light on? No. And I had no answer for that one, which I thought was wonderful. Lovely. Okay, one here, Olivier. Thanks. Yeah, Olivia Keenan, uh, Southeast Physics Network. Thank you for the talk, Andy. It's such an inspiring project. Um, I, I had a quick look and I realised you submitted a ref impact case study for this. <laughs> so I was going to ask a couple of things. So firstly, what were the challenges there with the evaluation, the kind of demonstrating change element? And then also very cheekily asking if you have any idea of what score you might have got for it. <laughs> um, right. So in terms of the evaluation, we couldn't have done it without getting the external evaluators in because they were able to provide us with independent evidence. We know how to gather that evidence, but if we gathered it, it wouldn't be as convincing. So that was important. Um, actually, our biggest challenge was not showing the change because we could do that by a combination of these are the numbers. This is a deep dive in a small fraction of those which we chose in a way to be representative. So we could do that. So that we were able to demonstrate. Biggest challenge was tying it to particular research papers, which is a nightmare. Um, and, and this sort of thing, to be honest, obviously stupid, but we managed to get away with it. We're fairly, I mean, overall, we don't know individual scores, but overall, we were very highly ranked for the impact. We're pretty certain this was a four star. Yeah. Uh, online next a question, please. Uh, <clears throat> this is a question from an anonymous attendee. How do you prioritize access and observing time limits? That's a very good question. Um, we tend to do it algorithmically, but I occasionally play with the algorithms to be, to be nice to people. Generally speaking, um, we're, we're close to the limits of the telescope time we've got, but we're very efficient in the way we use it. For example, if on a particular day, 50 primary school children all ask for an observation of Jupiter, we'll take one and give it to 50 of them because it would be silly not to. If two minutes later, somebody asks for a new one, they get a new one, it's always fresh for them. So that means we can be quite efficient. The way we manage the competing uh, challenges is two ways. Um, first of all, things that are harder to observe, we tend to prioritize slightly higher. So the moon and the planets we can do during twilight. They will be done every night, but it's clear, easy. If we want to get deep observations of a galaxy, we'll push them up the priority a little bit so that the telescope finds them easier to schedule. But the most important thing we do is for each individual user, which might be a student or it might be a teacher, their first few requests go in at very high priority and then it gradually drops down over the course of a term, and then the next term it resets. Um, the exception to that is if we think it's one of the programs which is associated with coursework, in which case it always goes in as a high priority. Um, but again, it drops down slightly as they get more and more requests. Generally speaking, or, um, I, I tend to divide the observing request into those we can realistically hope to do and those we can't. For example, we offer the option of observing Mercury, but we say we can almost never do this. So anybody who requests Mercury isn't going to get it. Um, but if we exclude all the ones which are very unlikely, about 90% of them are done, and the other 10% is nearly always because of bad weather. So we, it's efficient enough that we don't have to worry too much about that. Yeah. Great uh, question. Next question, one here. Thanks. Uh, I'm Sarah Russell. Um, so my question is, so you've emphasised that everybody loves astronomy, which of course they do, but I was wondering, uh, are there any groups that you do find a little bit challenging to get to, so particular cultural groups or teenagers or any, I don't know, is there anybody that you'd like to try to get, get yes. to that you haven't done yet? Absolutely. Um, the biggest challenge tends to be based on socioeconomics. So when we look at our distribution of schools, it, it actually roughly follows the demographic distribution of schools in the UK, you know, the same number in different uh, areas of preschool moves, the same number of private schools and so on. Um, but that probably means we should be doing more to reach the ones where there's going to be more benefit. So one thing we're focusing on is our new, in our new strategy is we're going to continue this national and international program, but we're going to have a particular focus on our local area, the Liverpool city region, because we can much more easily try something that's risky um, but we don't know if it's going to work and we can go to a school and say we want to try this can you give us one of your classes in the evening for half an hour we'll try it out and see if it works and then we can come back and that will allow us to target some areas which have significant social problems 
uh, one of the local authorities near us, Knowsley, does not offer A-levels, full stop. There are no schools in that area that currently, well, I think there's one that's starting to do them. So they have very significant, but very specific problems. And if we can help them address those, then we can roll that out of the whole country. So yes, there are demographics that are harder to reach. Um, it tends to be because the teachers are harder re to reach them than because the pupils are. Schools with no physics teachers are really hard to reach. So that's another target for us. So it's trying it out with a small number of schools where we know that that problem exists, but we have a way to reach them already. And then from there, find ways of rolling it out nationally. So that's the new strategy. That's what we're going to be focusing on there. Okay. Any further questions? Any more online at my oh, right? Okay. okay. Uh, Hands uh, everywhere. Yeah, where, where, the, where it is there. <laughs> Hi there. Um, just uh, uh, Stephen Gray here. A uh, quick question with regards. I know sort of schools in the name, uh, but with working with community groups myself, uh, carers and, and things like that. Um, just whether there's any access for for other groups outside schools, and even maybe if it's something you want to lo do locally with uh, within Liverpool. So not just the schools. Um, you know, young carers organisations. Um, you know, uh, send organisations or or possibly. Uh, pupils or kids who are not within mainstream uh, education as well after 20 years i'm regretting the name um it sounded great national schools observatory we don't want to be national we don't just want to do schools and it's not really an observatory but you know um as far as we're concerned if you're working with school age people to help them in some way that's education go for it sign up if it's community groups which are not school age, then there's a layer of registration we just call a user. We have teachers who are the ones who you know, are delivering, but one that we just call a user. Anybody can sign up to that, you just get less access. If it's not enough access, drop us an email and we'll see what we can do, um, which works very well. But when you come along and register as a teacher, there's a little box, if you're not, you know, and obviously a teacher in a UK school, it's a little box which says, why do I want this? You put something in that box, somebody looks at it and says, yeah, that's fine, off you go. Or if we think that's not appropriate, we can contact you and talk about possibilities. So if, you, if you're if you not sure, try it and see what happens. Okay. Uh, Q, and then... Q standing. Um, with um, Starlink constellations, do you add any commentary on the Starlink constellations in light that they also give internet access to Kenya? Um, we haven't done that yet, no. Uh, the, the project we had with tele Travelling Telescope was paid for out of a particular fund and then the money ran out. So they we can't now give them the additional resources to work specifically with us. So we can't do a huge amount. I mean, they're great people, but they have too many demands on their time. So we haven't started looking at the Starlink side of things. Um, it is changing the way we flag up observations. So, you know, every time we get an observation, if something weird happens with it, satellite goes through, an aircraft goes through, something like that, we flag it up. We don't stop the students see it because actually that's quite cool um but we're gonna have to do an awful lot more of that and so we've got to change the way that we, we flag up the observations but in terms of what starlink provides we haven't really done anything with that yet but it is something we would we'd like to look at yes okay and i'll take one more question here well first thank you for a very fascinating enthusiastic presentation on the subject um are you the only university observatory that's doing this, or are there you know, groups around the world? And is there some sort of international collaboration to sort of share out all these telescope requests? There are other pro similar projects. Um, in the UK, there's the Fawkes Telescope Project, and we've been going alongside by the identical telescopes, so that's handy. There's Commerce Observatory, um, do things internationally. There, there are other robotic telescopes around. There are telescopes which offer dedicated time somebody physically doing it for schools and so on we all talk to each other um but we don't tend to share out the the observations in that way just because of the logistics would be hell and it would also mean that the school children are not going to know what they're going to get and we can tell them the story of our telescope or if we if we work with another telescope we can tell them the story of that telescope we can show them the people who help build it we can show them the people who run it we can talk about where it is and, and, and the local communities and if it's too widespread and too disparate you can't do that anymore and you lose the the sense of the realness of those observations so there's no competition with, between these these projects we all work together and we're all trying to do the same thing we try and make sure that we don't clash and, and double up on things because that's a waste of time and effort but in terms of sort of one giant network of telescopes where we all just feed things in i don't actually think you would gain educationally from doing that 
um, except on one-off projects and things, which we will do. But no, it's, it's, it's a good thought and we do have those discussions, but it hasn't led to anything because we can't see the benefits of doing it. Um, we can't see that they don't outweigh the disadvantages. Does that make sense? Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank, thank you very thank much indeed. Um, for our final talk, we move on to a fascinating, the, the full recovery and analysis of the Winchcombe meteorite. Um, sounds almost like a Sherlock Holmes story to some extent. Uh, given by Mr. Ashley King, who is a UK RI Future Leader Fellow at the Natural History Museum, where he investigates the origins of the solar system and formation of planets through laboratory analysis of meteorites and samples return, returned by space missions. Ashley is also the current lead of the UK Fireball Alliance, U UK Fall, is that right? UK Fall, right? A collaboration between meteor camera networks that aims to recover freshly fallen meteorites in the UK. So we're um, we're in the geological society. So I thought it would be good to actually talk about a rock. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, yeah a bit of science and so not so much engagement um, for this one. Maybe a little bit at the end. Uh, I just want to say thank you. Um, so yes, I am the current lead for the UK Fireball Alliance or UK Fall. Uh, we are absolutely delighted to be awarded the Raz's um, uh, Group Prize for the recovery of the Winchcombe meteorite a couple of years ago. Uh, and so I'm really happy to be here this afternoon. I have a sort of at the end of a cold, so apologies if there's some coughing and spluttering, um, but hopefully I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, how we recovered this meteorite and some of the fun, some of the adventures we've been having over the last two years um, actually studying this. So UK4, there is a core group of UK4 members that kind of run this, um, it's a very loose collaboration, um, but the Witchcombe story is much, much bigger than that. I think there are basically 150, 200 people named on here. Um, it's been a huge team effort. It's not just me. It's not just UK4. Um, there are researchers all across the UK who've been studying this meteorite. There are the citizen scientists who run the meteor cameras that allowed us to actually track and recover this meteorite. And then also the local community in the Cotswolds um, have been wonderful in helping us find the meteorite, donating bits of the meteorite, and, and telling the story. You know, it's a lot of, not something that happens to you every day when a meteorite lands in your garden or on your driveway, you'll see. Um, so just very quickly, I wanted to introduce UK, the UK Fireball Alliance, or UK Fall, the name we came up with uh, in 2018. Um, I'm not going to claim credit for that. It seems to work very well. The aim of UK Fall is to recover freshly fallen meteorites um, in the UK. That's what we want. We want meteorites. Meteorites tell us about how our solar system formed. So that's what we set out to do. Uh, we do that in three main ways. We coordinate the data between the camera networks that we have here in the UK. Um, so we have cameras recording the skies basically all the time, tracking meteor, tracking fireballs as they're coming in. Um, we realized that we've got multiple networks in the UK. They weren't great at talking to each other. What we wanted to do is basically build a collaboration where we could share that data really quickly. And by doing that, we can take those observations and we can start tracking the trajectories for meteors and fireballs. We can work out the pre-atmospheric orbit. Where is that material coming to us from in the solar system? And then we can also work out if there's likely to be any meteorites on the ground. So that's our main kind of function. We kind of, we didn't deliberately do this, but we kind of become the face or the media side if there's a bright fireball um, in the UK. But this is important, particularly if we think there are meteorites on the ground, it's local communities who are really gonna have the greatest chance of finding those things. So getting the word out there, getting the correct information out into the press. And for Winchcombe, this was really important, uh, made a huge difference. And so we kind of take that role on and then we do go searching. Um, so we actually had two meteorite searches in the UK last year alone. We didn't find anything, unfortunately. The UK is a terrible place to go looking for meteorites. Um, but we do, we organize, we work out stream fields, we get teams together, we talk to landowners, and we actually go out and look for meteorites. So that's kind of what UK, or the UK Fireball Alliance is trying to, to do. This is a map, it's a slightly out of date map. Um, as I said, we have six different networks running in the UK. Some of those are citizen science led. So things like UK MARN and Nematode, they are just interested amateur astronomers who set up small yeah, they're basically a CTTV camera watching the sky. Um, I think UK Mon's been going for 10 years now. They've recorded tens of thousands of, of meteors and got orbits for, 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 for many of those from, from these um, observations. We have more institution that can, um, networks as well, like SCAMP. Uh, but we now, since Winchcombe, um, we now have over 200 cameras 
um, actually in fireball meteor networks in the UK. I think we have the densest, densest network of anywhere in the world. Um, so uh, Winchcombe was a big driver for that. We still have big gaps. Um, so if you know anybody up in Northern Scotland or bits of Wales and bits of Northern Ireland who are interested in cameras, please give us a shout. Um, we can't have enough cameras. The UK is very, very cloudy. So yeah, we can't, even with a camera system, we can't beat the cloud, but the more cameras we have, the more likely we are to see something somewhere. So I'm gonna take you back in time two years, nearly coming up to the second year anniversary of this. Uh, 28th of February, 2021, it was about five minutes to 10 p.m. I was getting ready for bed. Uh, suddenly on social media, let's see if this will play again. I'll skip through, I've ruined that. Um, so you've probably seen that before anyway. Um, but uh, so yeah, I'm getting ready for bed. Suddenly social media, Twitter absolutely lit up for want of a better phrase. Um, yeah, thank you. Because uh, there'd been a really, really bright Bible. The skies were really, really clear that night. Um, so this was seen all over the UK, um, even bits of Northern Europe and things, people were putting this. So we had well over a thousand reports of this bright fireball in the sky. And because we had this network of cameras, you know, I could just log onto the system, go, right, we've got some videos of this. What do we think happened? Do we think there are any meteorites on the ground? And so we knew very quickly we could work out from these fireball um, networks. So this was caught on 16 of the UK Falls um, cameras. Um, it was on loads of people's doorbell cameras and dash cam. We had so much footage, actually, we ended up kind of ignoring and throwing away most of it. Um, and we could work out basically what happened. So a rock about 15 kilos or so, maybe about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 meters in size, hit the top of the Earth's atmosphere, was going at about 14, 15 kilometers per second. It slowed down. We had this really bright streak in the sky that we call a fireball. And then at the end of that, we could actually work out, we could see fragmentation. So that was telling us it was very, very likely there were going to be meteorites on the ground somewhere in the UK. This was very exciting, didn't sleep very much that night. Um, and so this is actually the middle of lockdown. So we couldn't just get up and, you know, we do Cotswolds, rough the air. We had a, a kind of a rough strewn field, um, but we couldn't just get in our cars, couldn't get on trains to just drive over there. Um, so it's kind of a frustrating time. Um, and what we did and what we were prepared for, actually, having set UK fall up in 2018, as we went to the press, we, we already had a draft press release ready for this. Um, so we went to the news on that Monday morning and we said, you know, if you're in this area in the Cotswolds uh, and you find some black, unusual, maybe shiny looking rocks that have appeared in your garden, or maybe you've landed on your driveway, uh, can you take some photos? Can you collect them? Can you let us know? Uh, and we were really, really lucky that that is exactly what happened. So, so you've probably seen some of these pictures before. This is the splat, as I like to call it. Uh, looks a little bit like an upturned barbecue. Um, you know, it's basically black, charcoal-y type material. This is what the Wilcox family woke up to discover on their driveway on Monday, the 1st of March. Um, and they had absolutely no idea what was going on, I think, at that point. Um, so, yeah, this is, you know, Cotswolds, middle of lockdown. They weren't expecting anybody to be barbecuing. Uh, and they get up nine o'clock in the morning and there's this black material that looks like it's just dropped out of the sky. We were really lucky. Um, so they, they kind of realized what this potentially could be. And then we were really lucky that they got in touch with one of their sons who'd seen us on the news that morning. Um, and he went, oh, maybe you're, you're, you're slap bang in the middle of the stream field that's been released. Maybe this is meteorites. And so Rob Wilcock got his marigolds on. Uh, he collected up this material, these fragments. They're mainly, these are, this is a very soft type of meteorite. So you can see it's kind of just gone poof, basically, as it hit the driveway. So there's mainly fragments that are kind of millimeters, centimeters, and, and fine grain powder. But he collected all those pieces up. He methodically went over his lawn, picking out tiny little pieces. This made a big mess all over their garden. Bits went into the neighbor's driveway. Uh, there were fragments on the street. Um, and he collected all those materials up, put them into sealed bags. Uh, he took these photos and he got in touch with UK Mon. And then these photos, I think, came through to me on the Monday, late Monday afternoon, Monday evening or so. Um, so they did an amazing job in working out this potentially could be a meteorite. And, and following the guidance that we put out there, they're really, really exciting um, for us. And it was actually Richard Greenwood um, from the Open University, uh, who doesn't live so far away from Winchcombe, who was the first person to get over there on the Wednesday and actually confirm that we had uh, a, a fresh meteorite fall that had been recovered here in the UK. I got a very, very excited phone call from Richard, um, which put me straight on a train. I hadn't been anywhere for about three years. Uh, got this train out to Cheltenham. Nobody on the train. It was just a very surreal um, experience. Uh, because we knew we had meteorites on the ground, that meant we could try, we went through the pain and logistics and Caroline probably tell you a bit more about this, of actually getting permission for people to go and search in the area. Um, so as I said, many of us hadn't seen each other for, for two or three years. Uh, so this has become known as the proposal, this photo. Um, and this is me, this is a bag of meteorites that the Wilcock family had told me to take away and put somewhere safe. 
Um, and so we managed to get some small search teams from researchers across the UK down into the Cotswolds, down into Winchcombe. Um, and I was had, a, I guess, the privilege of going, this is what you're looking for. <laughs> Go and walk up and down those fields, find me some more black rocks. Um, and so we were really lucky. Uh, this is what a, a search looks like. You are basically just lined up. Um, you're maybe a meter, two meters apart, and you just walk up and down those fields looking for black rocks or, or things that look black and shiny um, in the fields. There are lots of things out there in the UK fields that look like black and shiny uh, meteorites that are definitely not. Um, we were really lucky that they, they, so it actually didn't rain at all. So Rob Wilcock, I should have said, collected that material up within about 12 hours of it landing. So short of it coming and falling in my lap at the Natural History Museum, we couldn't have collected that material any fresher or any quicker. It was a really amazing effort from them. Um, and it hadn't rained at all, didn't rain for about the following week after the fall. So the teams were out there for about five or six days, just walking backwards and forwards. It was the perfect social distancing um, exercise for them to do. So it was chilly, but not wet. Um, and, and we're really grateful they did, um, because one of the teams from the University of Glasgow on the Saturday um, found this absolutely beautiful stone. Um, this is the largest intact, I say intact, it's actually split into two pieces, unfortunately. But it was the largest <laughs> intact piece of the Winchester meteorite. Um, so it was slightly embedded in, below the surface in a sheep field. When they pulled it out, it, it split into two pieces. And uh, it weighs about 150 grams. Um, and this is the bigger 100 gram piece. And you can see the beautiful fusion crust on the outside of this. So this is what happens as that rock comes through the atmosphere. The outer layer basically gets burned, kind of gets cooked. Um, and then this, because it's split open, it's actually kind of nice for us because we can actually see inside. And we have a beautiful, dark, black, fresh carbonaceous chondrite. And I'll explain what they are in just a second. Um, and so in total, we have uh, just over 500 grams or so of the Winchcombe meteorite that were recovered, either from the Wilcox driveway or this stone. There were a few other uh, local residents in the area um, in the uh, village of Woodman Cove, which is to the west of Winchcombe, who also found fragments in their gardens that had come down. Um, so yeah, just over 500 grams is now being curated and analyzed and studied at the Natural History Museum. Um, and the total mass, I think we think is out there's about 600 grams or so. And that's actually, that, that 600 grams is what we would predict based off that fireball footage. So we think we've got everything. People always ask me, is there more out there? And I don't think there might be tiny fragments, but I don't think there are any big um, pieces out there. And we're also incredibly grateful that all those people who found meteorites donated them to us, um, which was wonderful. So we went, we told them why we were excited. I think me and Richard did a little dance whilst we were there. Um, and they just went, take it away and put it somewhere safe. And, uh, we'll talk about it later. So carbonaceous chondrites, um, my favorite meteorites. So it was even better for me that this one of these landed in the UK. Um, you know, often talk about them as the building blocks of our solar system. They are chemically pristine. Um, their chemistry is very similar to the solar photosphere. So they take us all the way back to the starting chemistry of our solar system. They contain some of the first solid materials that ever formed in our solar system. So minerals that were, were forming our solar system just over 4.6 billion years ago. Their name is carbonaceous, so they contain carbon. It's normally only about two or three weight percent, but it's enough to give them this really, really dark color. This isn't Winchcombe. This is a meteorite called Aguas Zarkas that landed uh, in Costa Rica, a very similar type of meteorite that fell in Costa Rica a few years earlier. Um, and that carbon comes in different forms, um, but some of it is organic in nature. Uh, and some of these carbonaceous chondrites also contain water. So it's not water that's sloshing around in the meteorite, but it's water locked up in those minerals. So when we think about what materials were there when we were starting to form planets like the Earth, carbonaceous chondrites probably had a really important role um, in doing that. But the problem we have with carbonaceous chondrites is they kind of just come to us randomly, and there are a few things that we don't know about them. Um, one, of that is, one of those is whereabouts in our solar system they originate from. What are their source regions? What kind of reservoir in our solar system are they telling us about? Uh, most meteorites are fines. They're things that we just collect on the ground, and we don't actually have an orbit um, or know anything about where they came from. And then if we're interested in organics and water and understanding why the Earth has organics and water and how these meteorites may have played a role in that, well, we, what we want is to measure the pristine extraterrestrial composition of those volatile species. And every meteorite that comes through the atmosphere is contaminated to some extent. But we want to collect these things you know, as quickly as we can, get them fresh, measure the water, measure the organics before that terrestrial contamination can kick in. And so by having a meteorite that we know was collected within about 12 hours is, is a dream for us. So Winchcombe's a really important um, sample. So I'll talk about the orbit a little bit. We have worldwide, we have something like 70,000 or so meteorites. We have orbits for about 40 of those. 
really, really rare to get uh, an orbit, but the camera networks mean those numbers are going up. And uh, so, uh, yeah, hopefully come back in 10 years and we'll have orbits for many more of these things. And, and having orbits allows us to kind of map out the geology of our solar system. So Wichicum is only the fifth carbonaceous meteorite um, for which we have an orbit. And you can see, so Wichicum on here is the, is the red line. I put the other five on there. So they're all coming from that kind of outer part of our asteroid belt um, between the orbit of Mars and, and Jupiter. So Winchcom is originating, at least it was knocked off a, a, an asteroid out there somewhere near Jupiter. It may have formed slightly further out from Jupiter originally, um, but that's what seems to be the main source of our carbonaceous chondrite. So that means we can start kind of looking at how the, the mineralogy and the chemistry of our solar system is evolving um, as we move further out from the sun. We also then, we often, we're geologists, we like to look at things down microscopes, we take a little bit of it, we'll polish it down, embed it in epoxy. Um, carbonaceous chondrites, as you can probably see from the pictures, they're very, very fine grains. So if you look down an optical microscope, you can't really see anything. So we need to go to electron microscopes that allow us to see the mineralogy in more detail. Um, most of the, the grains in here are, are probably less than a micron or so in size. So if you imagine a human hair is about 100 microns. So we're, we're looking at very, very fine grained uh, materials. What we find when we look at Winchcomb is a kind of mishmash of lots of different things, basically. We have uh, kind of larger, <laughs> oh, excuse me, larger grains, larger inclusions in there, and they're embedded within a really, really fine grain matrix that kind of cements it all together. And, uh, and then we have different rock types in there. So I tried to highlight, highlight with those kind of white lines, there's probably at least three, if not four, different sort of types of rock that have been mashed together to form this kind of Winchcomb meteorite. This tells us that it's coming from an asteroid that was probably beaten up by impacts in the early solar system. Those bits of fragments then got mixed together. Um, they got lithified to end up making this rock. We know that Winchcombe also contains solar wind. So it spent a period of its life actually at the surface of its asteroid before it got here to Earth. And then we can do, in an electron microscope, we can do things like chemical maps. Um, so on here, we have magnesium in red, um, iron in green, calcium in blue. Uh, so we have these things, these red things are mainly a mineral called olivine. These are the chondrules. These are some of those first solid materials that formed in our solar system. So they're just you know, around 4.6 billion years old. Most of this is, is um, matrix type material. It's very, very fine grained. It's kind of mishmash between this bit, kind of iron rich and magnesium rich in places. Those minerals are clay minerals. So they're, they're minerals that have OH and H2O bonds on them. And so which can meteorite is made up of about 70 to 80% of these clay minerals. And they're minerals that formed right at the start of our solar system through water-rock reactions. So we know, even early on in our solar system, water and rock were reacting on those asteroids. And we have carbonates in the blue, um, so those calcium-rich spots. So they are minerals that directly precipitated out of those fluids. And we can date those, and so we know that those water-rock reactions were taking place probably within uh, the first 5 to 10 million years of our solar system's history. So really, really early um, processes happening here. And then we're also interested in understanding the origin of Earth's water. And we think carbonaceous chondrites potentially played a role in doing that. And what we often try and do, our kind of smoking gun for understanding where the Earth's water comes from, is to look at the hydrogen isotopic composition. So on here, this is the D to H ratio. Um, everything on the Earth plots in that kind of orange box and the orange stripe across there. Uh, and what we're looking for are water-rich, volatile-rich bodies in the early solar system that match the composition of the water we have here on the Earth. And so when we go and look at comets, people often think comets, lots and lots of ice, they're water rich, they could potentially bring loads and loads of water to the early Earth. Well, it turns out, from, at least from the measurements, the remote measurements that we have so far, that their, their D to H ratios don't match particularly well with the composition of the water we have on the Earth. And so we turn to the water rich asteroids, which is what's represented by our carbonaceous chondrites, and they all fall below the Earth. So they're also not a great match. So this has always been a kind of debate is how much, what, what was the kind of fraction of comets and what was the fraction of, of asteroids contributing water to, to the air. So for Winchcombe, because we got it really, really fresh and we measured it really, really quickly. So these things are kind of like a sponge. They will suck up the terrestrial atmosphere. It doesn't matter how much you kind of try and minimize that. Um, but we measured it really quickly. We know we've got, what we're measuring is basically extraterrestrial water. And if you take the composition of the water in the Winchcombe meteorite, but a few other recent falls like, like Aguas Sarcas, um, they actually plot, not perfectly, but they plot, plot, their composition plots really close to the composition here on Earth. So I think this is telling us that, that bodies like the one that Winchcombe came from maybe didn't deliver all the water to the early Earth, but certainly played a really important role. And then just to finish, um, we also have about 2% carbon locked up within the Wichita meteorite, and that comes in different forms. 
So we have pre-solar materials. So this is dust that formed around other stars before our solar system even existed. So it's even older than 4.6 billion years old. Tiny, tiny grains, things like silicon carbide and graphite and silicates um, and, and nano diamonds as well, um, that can tell us about what was going on before our solar system. So they're present here in the, in the Winchcombe meteorite. We have those carbonates I talked about, and we can date those and, and use those to understand the chemistry of the fluids and when alteration was happening on, on water-rich asteroids. And then we also have the organic matter. Uh, and that comes in two different forms. We have the insoluble organic matter, the stuff that doesn't dissolve up. So things like this, this is an image that me and Sarah took, I think, um, very early on within a few days of the, the meteorite coming down. This is a carbon and nitrogen rich globule type material um, within the Winchcombe meteorite. So this is not life, but this is kind of those things as carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, oxygen bound together in there. And then we also have soluble organic matter, so things that will dissolve up. Uh, and within that soluble organic matter, um, we have really abundant things like amino acids. And amino acids are really important for making things like proteins. So Winchcombe not only contains water, and water that has a very similar composition to the Earth, but we also have those kind of building blocks, those initial ingredients you need to maybe think about kickstarting life here on the Earth. So hopefully I've convinced you that Winchcombe is by far and away the most important meteorite fall we've ever had in the UK. I think we have about 20 or so UK meteorites. Winchcombe is the first time we've ever um, found a carbonaceous chondrite. It was the first meteorite to be recovered in the UK for 30 years. Now we have the camera networks. I'm very optimistic it's not going to be another 30 years before we find um, the next one. Uh, as I said, it's we got it quick. It's very, very fresh. Um, it hasn't really had any terrestrial contamination. And so that means we can study the water and organics within this meteorite to understand what the volatile reservoirs or the com composition of the volatile reservoirs in our early solar system were. And also we have that orbit. So we can't tie it to a specific asteroid but we can certainly start saying or thinking about where these materials are coming to us from. And then I'll just finish, and this kind of fits the theme of all the other speakers that we've had today, is that uh, we've been incredibly busy in the lab, well, I haven't been incredibly busy sending emails mainly, but some people have been very busy in the lab um, analyzing Winchcombe for the last two years or so. And that's been a really important thing. And those papers, some of those started coming out at the end of last year, and there's another whole set of papers that are kind of coming out. A new one came out today about actually about terrestrial alteration of, of Winchcombe. Um, the other really important thing for us has been the outreach side and the engagement side. Um, this has been a, it was a good news story at the time, you know, everybody being in lockdown. We've been to festivals. Uh, Winchcombe Country Show was a particular highlight for me. Um, we did the Royal Society last year. We spent a week in schools just showing people bits of meteorite, showing them. And, and so, yeah, planetary science is a great way to get people excited about STEM type subjects and Winchcombe. Uh, has been a wonderful sort of excuse, I guess, for us to, to really make an effort and go out, uh, get people excited about meteorites. I should say that you can come and see a big chunk, that big 100 gram chunk is on display at the Natural History Museum, but you can also go to Winchcombe itself, has, there's a beautiful little town um, in the Cotswolds, has a little museum, they also have their own Winchcombe display there, uh, and the Wilson Museum in Cheltenham also has some uh, fragments um, uh, of Winchcombe that you can go and see. And I will happily take any questions, thank you. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, here first, Steve, and then at the back. So uh, the, the chemical composition is clearly incredibly interesting. Um, do, you, do you have a list of the amino acids that you've found? And have you found any sugars? in the um in the organic materials well, i'm not gonna even pretend to be an organic chemist um yes i can give you a list there is so the, the, the paper came out actually there were two papers now out that list the things like amino acids and sugars and, also, and the organic content that soluble organic content so i can I can give you those yeah yeah but i'm not gonna even try and bluff my way through organic chemistry <laughs> probably wise jim uh, okay um at the back and then we'll go online um, knowing the value of these pieces of rock, they can sell for between sort of hundreds of thousands of pounds to a couple of million pounds. And trading does go on behind the scenes. Is there a law like there is in archaeology when you find something, you just discover a find and have to give it to the authorities? Or is there nothing to support that? There is nothing. There's, so we work on it. Uh, we work on it belonging to the landowner, but uh, what we've kind of discovered is that there isn't really any clear laws around meteorite falls in the UK. It varies from country to country, but in the UK, it's a bit murky. Caroline might want to add more comment on that. Yeah. 
Caroline, can you just comment? Hi, I'm Caroline Smith. I'm head of collections at the Natural History Museum. Um, so you're absolutely right, and Ashley's right. There is no current law that covers um, uh, meteorites um, in the United Kingdom. Uh, other countries and territories do have laws that cover meteorites as being important scientific objects or cultural objects. Uh, but one of the things that was quite interesting uh, was we were able to get hold of, as Ashley said, this wonderful large 100 gram piece uh, that was um, a, that's on public display. Um, Nadine Doris, uh, who is a rather Marmite character, uh, became um, Secretary of State for Culture, Media and Sport and her first visit into the museum uh, sorry, first visit as DCMS Secretary of State was actually to the Natural History Museum and we showed her a piece of the Winchcan meteorite and we raised with her then this issue of uh, a lack of laws to protect not just meteorites actually but scientific objects of interest so that covers fossils as well and things like that. So DCMS because of the Winchcan meteorite are now interested in this as an issue and so it is gaining traction within government but obviously with all of the goings on within government it's probably gone back down the priority scales but at least it has piqued their interest so watch this space i hope it's not for taxation purposes though. well ah so that's another thing i should add um so one of the ways that we were able to grease or not no sorry how can i put this um <laughs> politely so, persuade politely persuade incentivize encourage uh however you want to put it so again that we set we've we set a precedent that we were able to use um, something called the Cultural Gifts Scheme, which is a way for people who have uh, things that are of cultural or historic importance. So often it's applied to artworks or other sort of antiquarian type things. Uh, we were actually able to use the Cultural Gifts Scheme, which is supported by the UK government uh, to um, let's say reward the generosity of uh, some of the finders of the meteorites uh, to actually donate them to the museum. So that has also worked very well. And again, we've set a precedent because it's the first time that has been done for a natural history object. Previously, it's always been done for things like artworks, manuscripts, books, things like that. So again, we've set a precedent there because so that's been really useful. Thank you very much. Uh, and on Mike, we gave them an honorary RAS fellowship. We did? Yes, 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 yes. 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 And I, I mean, they the Wilcox are just been a dream to work with um and they're obviously the the ones who've got all the glory I guess um but there are other uh, donors as well who've just been equally wonderful and helped us out but um yeah, yeah. online next and then uh this is a question about what you would do if you were to find a meteorite Paul W asks it's clearly desirable to log position and photograph a find but could you give some guidance please on picking up specimens for example, what sort of plastic bag would they contaminate it? Is it important to log which side was up and not to breathe on it? Very COVID. <laughs> so our general guidance is to take a photo and write down where you found it. If you're going to pick it up, try and do that wearing, you know, if you've got gloves, wonderful. Um, but if you've got a, a clean plastic bag or aluminium foil, something, anything that's kind of clean, um, we don't expect people to go out there and have kind of lab grade equipment for doing this or tongs or anything. You know, that's just it's not realistic, is it? But what's really important, and this is true for Witchcomb, is it came down and we have all the materials that it was collected in. So we have, I didn't show that, I normally show a picture of all the samples that we have at the, at the museum. The, um, Natasha Almeida and Helena Bates did an amazing job curating those. Um, so every bag, every cottage cheese pot from Waitrose or they use, every toothbrush that Sarah brought along that she'd stolen from her children to sweep powder, all that material um, is there. We have bits of the soil, we have bits, we have the driveway in the basement of the museum as well at the moment. So it means when we're thinking about things like contamination, we can monitor that um, more than we've ever really been able to do for meteorite. And so, yeah, if you put it in a plastic, clean plastic bag, don't have your sandwiches in there, but, um, <laughs> but if it's clean, collect it, we'll keep the bag and that. Acts as our kind of thing. Every little help. Every yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> is, is there another one online? Uh, yes. That's how the other one. Um, this is from Kate Earl. Why do you think it formed further out than Jupiter? Uh, I don't. Yeah, that's a good question. So we know what we can say is this is where it came from because uh, we have the orbit and we has it has water in it, so it must have formed beyond the snow line in the solar system. Um, there must have been uh, ice there accreting into that asteroid. Exactly where the snow line was in our solar system is, you know, a matter of debate. Um, so it might have been just within Jupiter, it may have been just beyond Jupiter. So we can't say quite exactly. 
Um, I suspect it was probably just beyond, but I think other people might tell you just within. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bill Charles? <coughs> We're almost exactly a decade since the, the biggest asteroid impact in our lifetime so far. Uh, of course, which was the Chelyabinsk asteroid. And one of the reasons that we knew uh, were able to get its orbit and everything so precise was a, a direct result of the intense levels of corruption within Russian uh, <laughs> society and insurance claims, so that everybody, but, but everybody who was a driver had a dash cam. Yeah. Now, this led to you know, the spectacular, spectacular results we all know of. Now, it occurs to me when I was very impressed with your camera network that you had in place for this, but we all know the problems of getting this information uh, in a, a climate like ours and the, the geography that we have. So uh, it, would it be worth emphasizing to anybody who's interested that having a dash cam, particularly when driving around uh, uh, at night, but per perhaps at all times, would actually be a potentially great uh, enhancement of your uh, of your meteorite network. Yeah, so the dash cams are wonderful, and, and what we also and I hadn't uh, thought about this, but when Winchcombe came came down, was those doorbell cameras that everybody has. So if you have a bright fireball, there was you know we get several a year. If you got you know there'll be a bright fireball, people start putting their doorbell camera stuff all over Twitter and social media, um, and they're wonderful. They're pretty low res, but you can see what's going on. What I would say about those is that, and this is true for Winchcombe, is that we just didn't need them. Um, but, but saying that, if they were the only things we had, we would use them. So all those other, so I didn't say this, but Winchcombe is by far and away the best, out of those five carbonation contract balls, it's by far and away the best recorded. All those other orbits are based off maybe one video, two videos that would happen to, to catch them. Um, Winchcombe, we have 16 videos that went into creating that orbit. So um, but basically it's a case of the more footage we have, the better. And then if we only have a doorbell camera and a dashbell cam camera, that's what we'll use. But we have so many cameras in the UK now that chances are one of them is going to get it. Okay, thank you. At the back? Uh, yeah, Colin Snodgrass. Uh, related <laughs> question, actually. Uh, you showed at the start your kind of map of the coverage, and there are areas where there is not coverage from these cameras. Um, has anyone... It, and this kind of relates to the, the topic earlier in the day and the outreach. Has anyone kind of done the analysis of where do you need to place these cameras? And, you know, could we go and find schools and colleges and whatever uh, that would be great hosts for them? So I have set up a camera in a school uh, maybe five years or so ago. There is a UK Mon camera that runs in a school. Uh, the problem and it's a great idea and it, and, it, and it was really fun and you go in and you teach people about meteorites and stuff and some of the science stuff could be slightly you know the trajectory stuff's a bit complicated uh the challenge is is uh, what we found is people uh it is having so we can get money we can buy cameras we can put cameras in uh, there were some challenges with installing a camera in a school as well because often they're pfi funded buildings and they won't put anything on a building and they won't attack can't go on their network and stuff like that so it was wonderful but it was a lot of work to do that uh, so my idea now is to, rather than put the cameras into a school, is to have the cameras somewhere that we know they can be looked after and have schools kind of affiliated with a camera. So that means you could have 10, 20, 100 schools signed up for one camera and they can have the data and they can look at the photos and they can, they can do stuff. That's kind of the, the, the plan. It's just people. It's just having the resources. Um, and it's not the camera resources. We can do that. It's having the people who can spend the time. But we're, we are working on it. Absolutely trying. Okay. Any more questions before we close? One, Chris, Christopher here. Thank you. Um, I've seen four great fireballs over the years, back to the Northern Irish fall of 19, April 1969, and I saw that actually from East Anglia over there. Um, uh, I, I have a sort of question about these things. Um, uh, you were particularly lucky with the Winchcombe fall that, uh, I mean, it's perhaps the most important type of meteorite, the most interesting in many ways, isn't it? Um, is there any possibility of fitting uh, any sort of spectroscopic capability to these uh, sky camera networks so that um, you, you don't have to get too excited about yet another boring nickel iron? Um, yeah, it was, but if it was it's a carbonaceous, if it's a carbonaceous yeah. one, yes. Um, yeah. 
any ordinary chondrites I'm just leaving in the field next time. Yeah, uh, yeah. But yeah, you're absolutely right. We actually do have some spectra. For, so some of the UK mom, some of the kind of amateur people do have um, spectrographs on yes. their cameras. Yeah. You lose the kind of, vid the way they set up, they lose the video. They sort of get the video, but they lose a little bit. Um, but they do get that. So yes. yes, we have got that. And well, we do have some of that data for Winchcombe. Um, it's not widely being used at the moment, but it's a good idea. The other, what we really want, our, our actual, the, what we want is radar. We want access to the meteoritical officer's yeah. radar so that if there is a black fireball, we can that helps us calculate exactly we can track the rocks basically down if they're yes. big enough. Yeah. So that's what our kind of challenge um that it's, it's a challenge for Wichita as well. We kind of got lucky that the rock, the fireball goes out, it extinguishes, I guess, at maybe well, for Wichita, it was 35 kilometers up the altitude, mm -hmm. and then the rocks fall out of the sky and what we call the dark flight. We can't track that. Yeah. So then there's a lot of modeling that goes into calculating the strewn field and that they can be blown off by many miles. Mm -hmm. So for which we were really lucky because it was clear and the weather was so stable that it just fell in a straight line. Um, but most of them don't do that. So what well, we'd like to- stopping you getting the radar? Uh, just access to the, 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 the I guess, the, yeah, we've tried. Um, it's not a quick and easy process. Yeah, the Met Office. Well, who who, who yeah, runs the radar? Well, we tried the Met Office. And they won't let you? Well, it's not they were it's just it's not their priority. So it's um come on, we should be able to do something. <laughs> yeah, that, so right? but if we had radar, then we can track them down and we can get those stream fields much tighter. So yeah. we wouldn't have two searches like last year where we didn't find anything. We'd have a much better chance. So yeah. uh, but it all goes together. Yeah, having the spectacle perfect as well. We can do that. It's right. is Robert Massey here. <laughs> <laughs> Pretending he isn't. <laughs> Can't we do something about it, Robert? <laughs> Not a question I was expecting, mind. Yeah. <laughs> it's, but it why not? Yeah. Well, well, see, it it it, it seems it's, seems a reasonable thing. Yeah, we can ask. Thing for us, yeah, yeah. yeah. See what we can do. Okay, I think that's it for the questions. Uh, so I'll, I'll try and draw things to a close. Thank you very much indeed for the talk. Uh, what an interesting two days. Uh, I've just been amazed at some of the, um, particularly the personal stories about how astronomy can influence individual lives. That's extraordinary. And um, the impact on STEM, obviously, um, the breadth of our outreach programs and other outreach programs and the incredibly novel ideas. Fantastic, really enjoyable. I give notice that next month, the NG open meeting of the society we will be on Friday, the 10th of March, 2023. And I remind you that now there will be a drinks reception in the RS council room straight after this meeting and straight across the quad. I look forward to seeing you there. Thank you very much to all our speakers and to all of you.